Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Jeff Gelblum from First Choice Neurology. I'm your virtual neurologist coming to you live from your virtual, virtual neurology office. And it's my pleasure uh, to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, purpose of today's uh, update, today's COVID update, uh, is to discuss an issue that I've been confronting over the past week or two in my office uh, in light of the significant social distancing, in light of the uh, perhaps isolation uh, that is going on across the country. Uh, and that refers to the specific problems of the caregiver. Uh, caregiving is one of the components of chronic neurologic disease. So if any of us have uh, family members with Alzheimer's, with epilepsy, with autism, with Parkinson's, we are all aware of the burdens that are uh, encumbering the caregiver. And of course, these burdens are even worse uh, when there is a situation of isolation. So let me take us through some of the issues that I see with my chronic neurologic patients and how those issues can impact on the caregiver and what we can do to mitigate or ease not only the, uh, the uh, problems with the patient, but also some of the emergent problems with the caregiver. And all of this is very, very important because during this COVID uh, lockdown that all of us are uh, subjected to, clearly the burdens of the caregiver are greater now than they've ever been before. So let's spend a few moments talking about some common uh, uh, confronting issues that all caregivers experience, meaning caregivers of Alzheimer patients, caregivers of epilepsy patients, caregivers of autism patients, caregivers of Parkinson patients, caregivers of stroke patients. So if you have a family member, a neighbor, a friend, or a loved one uh, that has any of these disorders, then clearly this Facebook Live update is geared specifically for you. And I appreciate all of you logging on. So we've got plenty of time for questions today. And I just wanna make sure that today's discussion addresses all of those needs. So let's first talk about the daily routine. Because as you know, a daily routine is part of caregiving, uh, of a caregiving algorithm. So if we've got a family member with Parkinson's, autism, uh, stroke, uh, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, the daily routine is imperative. And now that we're at home, uh, watching uh, TV perhaps all day, staying up at night, the daily routine, the circadian rhythm is very much disrupted. It's extraordinarily important that patients who have a cognitive illness, such as Alzheimer's, such as epilepsy, such as autism, maintain a strict daily routine. So therefore, instruction number one, stick to a strict daily routine, meaning get up at seven o'clock in the morning, go through your activities during the day, try and avoid uh, long naps for the afflicted patient because that will just disrupt the circadian rhythm. And if you're now getting into this cycle where you're sleeping until 10 and you're taking a nap from five until eight and then you're suddenly up until one or two o'clock in the morning, by definition, the circadian rhythm is becoming extraordinarily disrupted, and that can cause a decompensation of epilepsy, decompensation of Parkinson's, decompensation of Alzheimer's, decompensation of uh, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. So adherence to a very strict daily circadian rhythm, just like you would be doing if you were going out and going to work, or going to school, adherence to a strict circadian rhythm is imperative, particularly for chronic neurologic patients such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, autism, stroke. So that's what this discussion is geared to. So adherence to the circadian rhythm is imperative for both the patient and the caregiver, and you've gotta get out of this habit of sleeping until 10, taking a nice long afternoon siesta, figuring out what you're gonna do for dinner at nine o'clock at night, staying up till one or two in the morning, watching CNN or Fox News. These types of activities are not conducive to a healthy home environment for either patient or caregiver. So daily routine, circadian rhythm adherence, imperative. Next thing that I wanna mention is diet. All right, so we're all locked up and 
you're buying the beans and the rice and the carbs and the glycemic index foods. Remember, diet plays a role with mood. And patients who have chronic neurological disorders like Alzheimer's, like epilepsy, like Parkinson's, like autism, like stroke, are at higher risk of depression. And the data are inescapable that a high glycemic, high carbohydrate diet can exacerbate depressive symptomatology of either the patient or the caregiver. And I wanna remind you that not all caregivers are in 100% good health. If you're an elderly caregiver, if your husband or wife has a chronic disorder and they've got their Alzheimer's and then you've got your diabetes and your hypertension and, and your high cholesterol, then obviously being confined where there's 24 seven access to a refrigerator stocked with more food than it's ever been stocked with, then obviously there is a tendency to develop depression symptomatology. A, you're being cooped up. B, your daily routine has been extraordinarily disrupted. And C, your diet may be more glycemic than normal. So diet is an important component of mood, which is an important component of being a caregiver or being a patient who requires a caregiver because you as a patient have a chronic neurological disorder. So diet is imperative and that's why we've got to get away from high glycemic foods. So stop with baking the cookies and the banana breads and the pasta dishes. And I know it's very tempting because you're at home, but honestly, a high glycemic diet is probably the worst thing you can do if you suffer from a metabolic syndrome or if you're trying to take care of a patient who may be having a chronic neurological disease with susceptibility to depression or who suffers from hypertension or metabolic derangement as a comorbidity of that chronic neurologic disease. So really, we're at home, we're cooped up, you have a refrigerator full of food with enough toilet paper to last you until the year 2027. So the point is try and avoid a high glycemic diet, high carbohydrate diet, because all of that is going to exacerbate the underlying metabolic syndrome of either the patient or the caregiver. So daily routine, imperative, adherence to a strict circadian rhythm. Get up early, go to bed late, sleep your seven to eight hours, stop with the long afternoon siestas because that's disruptive to caregiver and patient. Maintain a low glycemic, high protein, uh, diet with lots of uh, fresh veggies and fruits to keep the zinc and vitamin C levels coming in because as we've discussed in our previous uh, discussions, uh, zinc and vitamin C can be somewhat antiviral in their uh, immune boosting capabilities. So it's very important that the diet that you're preparing is high in zinc, high in vitamin C, what has zinc, seafood, uh, meat products, beans. Those are excellent sources of vitamin C. And again, they're rather on the low glycemic index, assuming that you're not mixing up your beans with a lot of white rice. So diet is imperative for maintaining good, good mood. And it's also imperative for maintaining good health in the face of being sequestered, uh, of being uh, in a uh, safe uh, harbor zone uh, within the house. And, and the last thing you want is to have to go to an emergency room that's got a COVID section cordoned off if your sugar's out of control or if you're having chest pain. We've got to do as much as possible right now to make sure that our health is optimized because guess what? God forbid if you get sick with some cardiovascular disease or sugar out of control or you're having an allergic reaction because of all the peanut butter or everything else that you're eating, there may not be an emergency room treatment space available for you. So we've got to do everything possible in terms of diet to maintain healthiness of the caregiver and of course the patient. All right, so we've covered daily routines, circadian rhythm adherence, and we've covered diet. Third item that I want to go through today is exercise. And for exercise, I really do mean outdoor exercise. And there's no reason why if you are in self-quarantine or why if you are on a lockdown situation at home, like we are here in Florida, there is no reason why you cannot go outdoors and get the benefit of some fresh air and sunshine. And why is that important? Exercise is extremely important for our Parkinson patients. And this is something that the caregivers, the spouses, the kids, 
uh, the parents of a Parkinson patient need to adhere to. Because we know that Parkinson's disease is a problem of mobility. And what happens with a Parkinson patient is they tend to develop rigidity, stiffness. So how do we combat that? The easiest way to combat the rigidity, the stiffness from a Parkinson's disease patient is big, broad, bold movements. Big movements, broad movements, bold movements. Just sitting on your little Lexus cycle or your little treadmill at home indoors is not going to give the Parkinson patient the degree of flexibility that they need to avoid rigidity and contraction. Same goes for stroke patients. And that's why so many of my Parkinson patients take these boxer size classes. What is it about boxer size exercise that is so beneficial for a Parkinson's patient? Well, I'll tell you. What boxer size emphasizes for Parkinson's is that big, bold, broad, upper and lower limb strokes where equilibrium is part of the whole uh, exercise choreography algorithm, all of that is very beneficial to combat the rigidity and the disequilibrium that are parts, uh, that are components of the Parkinsonian disorder. So, if you are a caregiver of a Parkinson patient, rather than put them on the treadmill at home, rather than put them on the little exercise cycle that you may have in the den, it is imperative that you get outside and you emphasize big, bold strokes of movement because that is precisely what the Parkinson patient needs. And this can be easily accomplished by walking outside and doing this type of power walking where we are emphasizing big, bold strokes of movement. This is also important for a stroke patient to prevent worsening of the spasticity because remember, in a stroke setting, you get spastic, meaning the limb is like a clasp knife. In a Parkinson setting, you get rigidity, where the wrists and the arms are almost like a cogwheel. So that's the difference between rigidity and spasticity, Parkinson's and stroke. So if you are a caregiver for one of those types of patients, it is imperative that big, bold, full stroke movements be performed to prevent spasticity and rigidity affecting stroke and Parkinson's respectively. So those are very, very important components for your capacity as a caregiver to prevent your loved one from getting worse. And there's no reason why you can't go outside and make a whole game of it. They live in your house anyway. So there's no increased risk for both of you going outside. So take that Parkinson patient, push them out the door and say, come on, let's go for a big, bold, wide stroked exercise regimen for the next 30 minutes. And the vitamin D obtained from the sunshine is also going to be very good in terms of immune boosting. And the last thing you wanna get if you're uh, stuck in the house is a vitamin D deficiency because that can not only depress the immune system, making you more susceptible to the COVID virus, but remember Parkinson patients, stroke patients, epilepsy patients, autistic patients, all of those folks by definition have a significant comorbidity that could make a COVID virus much worse. So my neurology lecture today is geared to trying to maintain as optimum as possible the health of these chronic neurologic patients who if they get sick with COVID could have a much worse outcome. So we've discussed adherence to the daily routine. We've discussed maintenance of a low glycemic, high protein, fresh fruit and veggie uh, diet regimen. We've just discussed exercise, which must emphasize big, bold, large stroke movements with an eye toward vestibular balance, meaning uh, you can even try and stand on one foot outside, stand on the other foot. And again, it's this outside walking that promotes the sense of equilibrium and balance that is far superior to anything you'll get on an indoor treadmill or an indoor bicycle. Okay, so outdoor exercises, it's the beginning of March, pretty much throughout the U.S. where this Facebook Live is being uh, watched right now. Weather's pretty much good everywhere you go. There's, no re there's absolutely no reason to stay cooped up inside the house. Okay, so outdoor, big, bold, wide stroke exercises are imperative. Item number four, which I kind of touched upon with a daily routine. Adherence to a strict sleep-wake cycle. 
How many of you now, because you're not going to work or you're working from home, you have your 10 o'clock Zoom conference to get to work. It's now on Zoom. It's not like you got to really shower and shave for the Zoom conference. I mean, I'm sitting in my office shower shaved. I've got on a nice clean starched shirt. Honestly, you don't know what's doing from the waist down. I do have trousers on, so don't worry about that. And I'm seeing patients in the office today for some emergencies. But clearly, if you've got a 10 o'clock Zoom AM, why you're not going to get up till 9.45, and then after the Zoom is done at 11, you might go back to sleep, or now it's time for lunch, and then I'm going to take my afternoon nap, and then I'll get up at 4 for another Zoom. It's very imperative that you are, that if you are a caregiver for a chronically uh, impaired neurological patient, again, geared toward epilepsy, Parkinson's, stroke, Alzheimer, autism, if you're the caregiver, please keep them on a strict sleep-wake cycle because we all know that any disruption of the sleep-wake cycle is not only going to exacerbate, going to worsen the chronic neurological disorder, but God forbid you don't want that patient now falling into a circadian rhythm where they're sleeping during the day and up at night and then you're trying to sleep at night and they're now uh, asleep during the day and it's not good. So we all need to maintain a very good sleep-wake cycle, okay? And this is imperative for caregiver, it's imperative for patient, and I wanna remind you that disruption of a sleep-wake cycle is one of the leading contributing factors for the emergence of a depression disorder. So if you're starting to sleep during the day and you're now up at night and then you're taking these long siestas, too much sleep can precipitate a depression disorder as well as too little sleep. So all of this is very important for the caregiver. It's also very important for the patient who is neurologically challenged. So strict adherence to sleep-wake cycle, imperative. So what have we discussed? Daily routine, must maintain that as best as possible, even though it's kind of hard if we're stuck in the house. Before you used to take mom out to the mall or the restaurant, well, that's not really happening. So anything that you can do to keep that those uh, time cues going for the chronically uh, neurologically impaired patient is gonna be very important. We've talked about adherence to a low glycemic diet. We've talked about the need for broad stroke exercises, which is simply accomplished by going outside and marching like this and maintaining your good sense of equilibrium. And we've just discussed strict adherence to a sleep-wake cycle, similar to what you were doing when you had to get out of the house and go to work. And one of the issues, of course, with caregiving is if you used to have a helper come into the house, well, that may not be happening. Uh, if you're used to dropping off mom at a daycare center for her Alzheimer's, that's not happening because those things are closed. So it's imperative that if we're all working from home and we are sequestered with our loved one, with whom we serve as caregivers, everybody has to maintain the sleep-wake cycle. Okay. So let's talk about the fifth item that is imperative for preventing further neurologic disability to those patients with some cognitive dysfunction associated with Alzheimer's, as well as some Parkinson's, uh, autism, uh, epilepsy, and stroke. Tactile stimulation. Tactile stimulation is imperative. Now, when you're out and about, or if someone is in a stroke rehab program or an Alzheimer's daycare center, Tactile stimulation is part of that daily routine. And what is tactile stimulation? Tactile would be anything from uh, knitting to meal preparation, anything that's using the hands where you have to integrate your visual functioning, your cognitive functioning, and then your hand functioning. And, and what is that all about? What does that mean? It means that the integration of all of those modalities is a very stimulating process for the brain. So if you're just putting mom now in front of the TV while you're doing your Zoom meeting for work from home and mom has Alzheimer's and she's just watching CNN or Fox News, at that point there's no tactile stimulation going on. And the tactile stimulation, the hands-on manipulation stimulation, that's imperative to make sure that mom's level of cognition stays intact because you don't want to suffer any significant decompensation of an Alzheimer's disorder or a Parkinson's disorder as a consequence of being stuck indoors and being deprived of daycare, etc. So it's imperative that we maintain good tactile stimulation for those patients in the house. So what is tactile stimulation? 
meal preparation, asking mom to stir the potatoes, uh, assuming that she's not manipulating the temperature on the stove and burning the house down. Tactile stimulation would be a jigsaw puzzle where you're not only using the visual capacity, but the finger dexterity capacity to keep those, uh, those modalities intact. So let's go back to the old fashioned jigsaw puzzles, pull them out of the closet, dust them off the attic uh, shelves, and let's start with that because that's a great tactile stimulation. Sudoku, crossword puzzles, not much tactile stimulation there. But meal preparation in the home, uh, jigsaw puzzles where you have to find the little pieces and fit them in, that's great for tactile stimulation. And that's, that's an important modality that is now causing integration of all of the areas of the brain. And I wanna remind you, one of my joys as a neurologist who also is involved in teaching residents is being able to communicate the nuts and bolts of neurophysiology and neuroanatomy uh, to my friends and patients. And I wanna remind you also, don't ever take neurological advice from anyone but a bald neurologist because we can point to all of the areas of the brain that you need to know about. So going forward, if you ever see a neurologist with a big uh, fancy hairdo, run out of the office. You're not gonna get the information you need. Always take advice from a bald neurologist. So we've talked about tactile stimulation, imperative. We've talked about adherence to a strict sleep-wake cycle. And again, this is for maintaining uh, caregiver and patient health, tactile stimulation, more so for the patient and particularly if it's an issue of Parkinson's, epilepsy, or autism, tactile stimulation imperative. Uh, Sleep-wake cycle, good for everyone. Exercise, good for everyone, but particularly with those patients who have motor disabilities such as Parkinson's or stroke, where they're susceptible to rigidity and spasticity, respectively. So exercise, important, big, bold, wide movements, not getting on a treadmill and not going on the exercise cycle at home because that doesn't accomplish the big bold movements that are required to prevent further spasticity, further rigidity from stroke and Parkinson's. Diet, again, low glycemic diet, imperative to prevent depression because it's thought that high glycemic, simple carbohydrates can exacerbate a depression. I know we all like our chocolate cake, but honestly, it's not good if you're suffering from a metabolic comorbidity such as diabetes or high cholesterol that caused dad to have the stroke to begin with. So let's get away from the high glycemic foods, even though those are the comfort foods that we're all whipping up at four o'clock for prompt devour at five o'clock in the afternoon. And then of course, adherence to the daily routine because that's been disrupted because we're all stuck in the house. The last issue that I wanna mention is sunlight. Sunlight is, is so important uh, because sunlight provides UV, radi uh, UV radiation, which is not only useful for vitamin D synthesis in the skin. And I wanna remind you, just 15, 15 minutes of sunlight is equivalent to taking a 2,000 unit vitamin D capsule, and it's better absorbed than a vitamin D capsule. So therefore, uh, outdoor sunlight, UV radiation, is not only useful for vitamin D synthesis, but also, as you know, is useful to prevent depression, not only for the caregiver, but also for the patient. So thank heavens, although we've got this horrific corona crisis, it's April. We can all go outside and enjoy whatever sunlight is available to us. Thank heavens in Florida, we have a lot of it. But even if you're up north, Chicago, New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the sunlight is coming through, please go outside. It's very, very important, not only for vitamin D synthesis, which is an immune booster and maintains strong bones, but is also important for mood stabilization and prevention of further depression. And I want to spend a moment talking about depression because depression is a common comorbidity of Parkinson's, of epilepsy, of stroke, of autism, of all of the neurodegenerative disorders, all of the neurological chronic conditions. Uh, depression is a hallmark of that. Uh, and at some future point, we can go into what exactly is the physiologic cause, the neuroanatomic cause. But to suffice it to say, depression is a common comorbidity. If patients are cooped up inside, uh, if they are disrupted from their daily routine, if you as a caregiver are now disrupted from your daily routine, which I know you are because you're not going to work, you don't have access uh, to the supportive uh, systems for your loved ones, so there's no more daycare, uh, there's no more adult care going on, you, you're not getting any respite care, 
you need to be very attuned to the symptoms of depression and that's why natural UV light from the sun, lots of exercise and low glycemic diet can help alleviate that as well as adherence to a strict circadian rhythm and a strict daily schedule. So sunlight is imperative. So we've talked about adherence to daily routine. We've talked about adherence to diet. We've talked about exercise, big, broad, uh, large stroke movements. Uh, we got a question just recently about what about dancer size, dancing, perfect, as long as it involves big, broad, strokey movements. We won't, we, I, I'm not a big advocate of the Irish uh, stomping exercises because that doesn't do anything for the upper limbs. You wanna try tango at home. Uh, you wanna try waltzing at home. Anything that promotes big, broad movements and adheres to some uh, requirement for equilibrium and balance uh, river dance is not it, but waltzing, tango, dancing a horror with you and your caregiver, perfect. Uh, so we've talked about the exercise requirement. We've talked about adherence to a sleep-wake cycle. We've talked about tactile stimulation, something as simple as a jigsaw puzzle or getting your loved one to assist you in the kitchen with sandwich preparation, anything that requires fine dexterity. And then, of course, we've talked about the requirement for natural light. UV uh, sunlight is your safest and easiest method to prevent uh, depression and to enhance serum vitamin D levels. Uh, again, I don't want anybody getting a sunburn. That's likely not going to happen in April up north. It always happens here in Florida. So 15 minutes a day is really the equivalent of 2,000 units of vitamin D taken via capsule. So we've spent a lot of time talking about these six simple measures that will not only help the caregiver as well as the patient. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I invite you to log on to our website, fcneurology.net, firstchoiceneurology.net, but it's fcneurology.net, where this infomercial live Facebook feed will be uploaded in about 15 minutes. Feel free to share that with your friends. Feel free to share this with your friends. And all of us at First Choice Neurology are hosting these every other day Facebook Live outreach programs to keep our neurological uh, clientele apprised of all the nuts and bolts of what you need to know uh, during the COVID crisis. We've talked about what happens with uh, epilepsy drugs if they are interfacing with potential COVID antibiotics. We've talked about anxiety in the Alzheimer patients as relates to the COVID crisis. So we are here for you. Uh, we are doing daily telehealth visits. Uh, so if you need to see your neurologist at FC Neurology, we're here. We just do telehealth and it's as easy as clicking the link on your phone and then you get to see me, at least from the chest up, which I apologize for because this is as big as the screen can get, but at least I'm showered, shaved, and in my white jacket ready to serve. Uh, and you'll have access to our other neurologists as well. So if there are no other questions, I appreciate your time and, and coming to visit me today. It's the same as what you would get with a televisit. And I wanna remind you that we are here for you. We understand uh, the uh, challenges that the patient is facing as well as the caregiver. So if there are any questions that you have, I'll take them right now. Uh, I'm not seeing anything come up specifically that has not been addressed as pertains to the uh, caring for the caregiver uh, topic, uh, but you have my uh, email address. It's jgelblum at fcneurology.net, and we are here for you all day long, every day of the week, to make sure that you are staying healthy and safe. And on that note, I'm going to send you all a social distance hug and an air kiss, and I wish you well. And I wish you a great weekend. And if there's anything you need from me or any of my colleagues, we are here to serve. And I appreciate your time and attention this afternoon. Have a wonderful afternoon and have a very safe weekend. Bye-bye.